Hey guys, this is Trevor Mueller, creator of Nexus Point, Repossessed, and Magical Natalie, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? Our guest today is a returning guest. I think he is top three of the most returning guests on Two Geeks Talk, right next to Dirk Manning, I believe. So six or seven times, at least, in, in the 15 years of this show. You know his work, of course, from Albert the Alien and many other comps, including Nexus Point, which was a previous interview last year. We're joined today by the ever-talented Trevor Mueller. How are you doing today? Good, Kurt. Thanks so much for having me back, man. And to hear that Dirk is yeah. beating me out in terms of number of times. I have to ask the question, do I still have the record for longest oh, interview? Our interview of four hours, <laughs> which which only half of that got released, reasons, is still a concept and, and an interview I always bring up on every interview that I get that I get to talk about. Because four hours, it was literally a four hour and a half hour conversation. Your skill set as a talented creative individual, as well as the fact of con stories and a bunch of other things that was happening seven or eight years ago but it's safe to say that you are at least you have to be at least one interview behind dirk at least when it comes to being on the show so we'll increase the frequency and that way i can be number one in two categories i'll take it that's fine <laughs> uh but we're not here to really talk about that but it, i'd always love to have you on the show because you're so full of, of creative talent you are always having something on the go you have a convention coming up as well too this weekend? Uh, yes. C2E2. Uh, C2E2 this weekend. And then I think there's a week off. And then the week after that, I'm at Emerald City in Seattle. That's amazing. Yeah. So for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing today to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah. So Trevor Mueller, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a comic book writer. I've been doing this shtick for a good 10 plus years. Uh, some of my, uh, mostly I work in the web and self-publishing. Um, and so a lot of my stuff tends to start off on the web and then move over into like a published graphic novel. Um, my latest series was Albert the Alien, uh, which was a young reader's adventure story about the first foreign exchange student from outer space. Um, we were the first young reader syndicated series on Mark Wade's Thrillbent website. And uh, we got nominated for two Harvey Awards uh, collected all of those uh, web comics into over four graphic novels uh, and kickstart funded all of those uh, books um, so that you can own them today. Uh, so I'll be selling those next weekend or this weekend, I should say, at C2E2 and Emerald City. And now I'm starting to do my return to web comics uh, after taking a couple years off and just kind of focusing on print stuff uh, with Nexus Point as a Webtoon original series. And then uh, next or later this month, I should say, uh, we'll have Repossessed coming out on Webtoon Originals as well. So we, we talked about Nexus Point way back when, and that was before it even got released onto Webtoons or it was in the process of being released. Mm -hmm. um, it is safe to say that it is an amazing read so far because I am subscribed to it on Webtoons. I love the action. I love the characters. You know, we talked about it at great length during our interview. But now that it's in the wild, how has it been for you and what has been the reaction? It has been amazing. New things that kind of came out since we talked about it last year was the addition of music. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's Webtoon, you're able to add in animation, you're able to add in music. And I was talking to a buddy of mine, former Power Ranger actor turned anime voice actor, Johnny Young Bosch. Mm -hmm. And Johnny got really, really excited about this story, really wanted to get involved in some way. And so very generously uh, gave us two things. One, he did the music for the series, which you can hear in the episodes when you're reading it. It's totally free to read on Webtoon. Um, he's made two songs so far. He said he wants to make another two or three more to go. Uh, and then we also did a trailer for the series and he uh, offered up his voice to be in that trailer, which is again, free to watch on my YouTube channel, Trevor A. Mueller. Uh, is is my YouTube alias. So 
find me, follow me, friend me, uh, and check out Johnny's uh, video. So that that was quite fun and exciting. Reception to it's been extremely positive. Uh, all of the comments that we are seeing so far on the series um, are almost 100% positive. Uh, and so fans really seem to be digging the look of it. Um, it's quite different from anything else on the platform, which was it was intended to kind of be. And we've got a couple of other big promotional uh, pushes that we're going to be doing for the series as the year progresses. So uh, lots more to kind of come for Nexus Point. It's going to be at least 50 episodes uh, and fingers crossed we do well enough to get a second season. But if not, uh, we always pitched it as, you know, at least one season. So uh, we'll at least tell a complete story there. And it's safe to say that whenever you come on the show, you you at least have three or four things always on the go. And and obviously we're here to talk about Repossessed and, and of course, Mag Magical Natalie as well, too. Uh, tell us about Repossessed first and, and that concept, because it, I looked at the art and, and for once you sent me, I'm like, this looks like another wild time from the mind of Trevor Mueller. <laughs> Repossessed is going to be very different from Nexus Point, and it's going to be very fun. I pitched it as like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but the main character is like the lazy dude on the team. <laughs> and also it's like Clerks meets like Army of Darkness. So it's... It's kind of a, a supernatural workplace comedy is the way I like to think about it. But the the general premise of it is uh, the main character, Troy Richardson, is this lazy college student in his freshman year of college. And his parents have gotten fed up with him and cut him off financially because his grades are dropping. So he's forced to get his first job working at a mysterious pawn shop that sells demonically possessed antiques. And because he is a lazy slacker and doesn't pay attention, he's, of course, uh, sold some of the deadlier pieces, and he has to go get them back before they start killing people. Uh, hence, it's called Repossessed. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So Yishan Lee is my artist uh, on that series. She actually worked on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the comic book series. Oh, wow. Uh, which was quite ironic. And then she also does a lot of work with Top Cow uh, mm -hmm. doing Sugar, their swing series as well with Matt Hawkins. Uh, so very, very talented artist, uh, very, very different art style from what we've got going in Nexus Point. And she just absolutely loved the idea, loved the concept, and she's bringing so much to this series. So I'm very excited to release that one later in August. Where, are we, where can we find this as well, too? Because I have to ask that question. It'll be another Webtoon original series. Nice. So it'll be on Webtoon's platform. It'll be free to read. When it goes live, um, they will update three episodes, and then you can fast pass into or pay for early access to the next three episodes. And then after that, it'll release you know a new episode every week. Uh, one of the fast pass episodes will become free, uh, and then there'll be a new kind of fast pass episode as well. Uh, and again, another fifty episode season, so weekly, right? That's going to be about a year that we'll be updating both Nexus Point and Repossessed at the same time. Uh, <laughs> but Nexus Point, you know, at least releases uh, evenings on Friday. It says Saturday on the website, but it's like 7 p.m. on Friday, Central Time, uh, is when it releases. And uh, Repossessed, right now, they're targeting a Tuesday release. So TBD on, on that, but it should be out later this month. If people follow me on social media, you'll, of course, see me guffawing about it. Um, but it's very, very funny. It's it's really quite interesting. I think I sent you the promotional poster yep. and we're we're working on kind of two uh, taglines for it. Uh, one is like saving the world is a part time job. <laughs> um, and the one that I like even better than that is saving the world for minimum wage. <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, that. that's a good tagline. I, I think it's works. It's going to be really, really funny. Uh, again, it's me pulling out uh i think all the stops when it comes to just how goofy and silly we can get channeling again like that stuff that you saw in like evil dead where like ash is you know freaking out with like a deer's head on the wall and it's like well what if that deer's head actually worked at the store and wanted to kill everybody like you know and what kind of goofy and silly situations could the characters get into that have you know uh equity behind them i mean they have danger and characters can and and will die as the series goes on but it also has that like over the top just goofy factor to it um one of my favorite chapters so and this one we're structuring a little bit differently too so like every six episodes is going to kind of be like a story okay um 
So like there'll be something that kind of goes on and by like episode six, like that conflict will kind of resolve and we'll move on to the next one. And I'm just kind of doing that just to to keep introducing new possessed elements for them to kind of battle uh, throughout the entire series. Uh, and one of my favorite ones is when they go after a set of possessed golf clubs at a golf resort. And uh, when somebody touches one of the possessed golf clubs, it turns them into like this uh, skeleton warrior mm-hmm. who starts slamming the golf clubs into other people's heads and turns them into golf zombies. <laughs> so suddenly the heroes have to like stop the zombies from getting out. And they're like, if if they bite somebody, do they turn into zombies? How does this work? Like they're trying to figure out the rules of being a zombie uh, within, you know, while they're trying to save the world. It's, it's, awesome. it's really quite hilarious. <laughs> it sounds like you're trying to fill a hole for, for some of the shows that we, we know and love from back in the day and that are sorely missing in, in today's media. It's me channeling kind of my love of, what at the time was probably revolutionary, but now is considered quite campy, 70s and 80s era horror, right? Like, and it's it's embracing the campiness, it's embracing the comedy element of it. Um, and again, because it's Webtoon, it's in a bit of that manga format. So it's it's got some of the exaggerated kind of character reactions to certain situations, which I, I really feel just kind of endears it even more uh, and really humanizes some of the characters. We'll have a lot of really fun surprises, I think, throughout the run of this uh, series Um, and so much uh, foreshadowing kind of set up in the beginning for things that will like come to pass much later in the season. I won't spoil anything, but uh, we we had to get a couple of things uh, run past brand safety, which is like their 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 censorship team over at Webtoon. Mm -hmm. And we were like, we just need to make sure that we're okay with this. Uh, or that it's not going to get us like slapped with like an 18 plus readership thing. And they're like, no, you're fine. And I was like, good. All right. Rock it. <laughs> Love it. So we'll yeah. be pushing the envelope a little bit in a couple of areas, but again, not, not enough to like freak out the more sensitive readers. So then your other series of course is, is magical Natalie. I saw the artwork for that as well too. Who's the team behind that? Of course, obviously yourself as a writer, but yeah, who's your so artist? Katie Fleming is my artist on Magical Natalie. And Katie is a member of the LGBT community. Uh, We had pitched this series to Arledge Press, who is an LGBT publisher. And I wanted to make sure that the entire team working on the book were part of the LGBT community. Uh, I consider myself an ally, uh, but but that way we can kind of give give some of those creators uh, a platform. And, And Arledge was uh, has has been such a huge supporter of those types of creators. So the fact that they gave me an opportunity uh, to kind of get this book out for them was wonderful. When I approached Katie to work on the series, uh, you know, I, as as a as a straight white man, I was sitting there just kind of like, I want to be very sensitive, right, to like the kind of content that we put in here, the type of story that we're trying to tell. And there are very important stories uh, among the LGBT community that. I should not be telling, uh, right? Like, I don't need to be the person that tells a coming out story. I've never experienced that. And those are very important stories to kind of get out there into the world. And that's something that somebody who's kind of lived that, I feel like, really needs to bring their authentic voice to it. So when I when I approached Katie, I was like, if you want to tell a story about people like coming out, that's probably not an area where, where I'm going to be comfortable playing. If you want to tell a story about two women that are in a uh, healthy and established relationship and they're going out into the world and having kick-ass adventures, I'm on board for that. Like I can absolutely do that story. And she's like, that's the kind of story I want to draw. So the premise behind Magical Natalie is Natalie is this magician who is one of the few magicians who can use real magic and she's kind of become a viral sensation on the internet and her girlfriend lulu is the lead singer in a heavy metal band and they've finally reached such a point of popularity that their agent has started to book them on tour and their first stop is in las vegas so one of the biggest cities for magic for musical acts in the world uh, and that's their first stop. And in the the first show, their very first performance in Las Vegas, one of their best friends is killed on stage by a demon. And suddenly they are thrust into this supernatural murder mystery conspiracy where they have to figure out why this person was killed, where are demons coming from, uh, and what's kind of going on behind the scenes. 
in Las Vegas. It's Vegas. Anything can happen. Like it, It's a really fun story. It it pokes at a lot of the tropes and the things that like Las Vegas is known for, but does so in kind of like a PG 13 way, right? It's not the hangover, <laughs> um, but it's a, uh, it's, it's, it, it essentially is, is a, is a pitch that I had in the back of my pocket for DC comics back in the day. And I remember that uh, Scott Snyder had been looking for pitches to kind of do for some of their uh, lesser known characters that were out there. And I was like, I really wanted to do a story with Zatanna and Voodoo from Wildcats. And I was like, that just feels like a really kind of cool and unique pairing. One of them has like Daemonites and kind of like weird kind of metaphysical stuff going on. The other one does magic and lives in this world of the supernatural. And how do I kind of bring these two things together? And even though that pitch got rejected, I was like, I still love that story. I still want to tell it. And so it kind of snowballed and pivoted into this story. Um, and so it's got a lot of, you know, music, a lot of Vegas culture in there and and just a lot of really cool um, moments between these two characters and the types of things that they have to deal with, both as young influencers and performers and as well as a young but established couple. I'm always curious about this. You've written many, many stories in the past and continue to write many, many stories in the future. But out of the, the stories we've talked about today, what world would you survive in the longest? <laughs> okay. Um, not Nexus Point. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like that one uh I would be doomed. Um, you know, probably Albert. Albert the Alien, again, is just a, a world I keep coming back to, and it's so fun and it's so different and it's not dissimilar from the world that we live in today it just has like this extra element kind of added in there that throws in like some some comedy adventure pieces and you know i wouldn't mind hanging out and flying saucers and jetpacks and flying around and having a good time like that like i'm all for it um but you know with the occasional jello mold that might try to eat me uh <laughs> I would have to watch out and make sure that I was on my toes. I'm still just such a fan of, of Albert in that world, but I do tend to channel a little bit of myself, I think, into some of the main characters. I mean, the, the character of Troy Richardson in, in repossessed is not dissimilar from the character of me, Trevor, in my original webcomic series, asshole, because that guy was also like a lazy slacker, who had to learn like responsibility and stuff. And Troy undergoes like a similar type of journey within repossessed. Um, and I guess if he's able to make it, I'll, I'll probably be able to survive in that world. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, but it's yeah. Albert, Albert is the short answer to the question uh, <laughs> is the world I would survive in the longest. You're looking at the scripts that you've created and, and of course you, the various art, uh, amazing talented artists that you have on on each of the these stories we're talking about here today mm -hmm. uh, nexus point uh, magical natalie and, and repossessed what was a, a scene in well that you could talk about in your scripts where you got the art back and you thought man this is just way better than what i had on the page i mean every page <laughs> i get back fulfills those requirements uh <laughs> you know i i I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples because even even in the character design phase, especially with Nexus Point, like I gave very light description. Um, you know, I, I told my artist Sebastian von Bachwell that it's a cyberpunk story, and he's like, "I'm going to stop you right there. I'm in." He's like, "I really want to draw like cyberpunk characters," and I gave him very light descriptions, and he just took it and ran with it. And I told him at one point, like we. We need to have like three or six hacker characters and three or six like bounty hunter characters. And he turned in these iconic looking like designs. And I was like, crap, well, now I got to name this character and give them a backstory and somehow make them a part of the story. They don't just show up in an episode and never again. They have to be there. Um, and that's happened a lot with with what he's turned in on on the character sheets and in the story there was a, a TikTok video that I ended up making because I think it's in episode four of Nexus Point. There's a, a, a line that I wrote that this character like kicks in the door. Um, and that was all I wrote. I was like, this, this female character kicks in the door. And he drew this awesome and intense sequence where it like shows her eyes narrow. It shows her like wind her leg back. And then the door flies across this apartment like 30, 40 feet 
just across. And then she just walks in like she's done nothing. And I'm like, you are brilliant, sir. <laughs> and then with uh, with Repossessed too, like Yishan didn't do like a lot of upfront kind of design work, but every page that she turns in is gold. And she's designed characters just in panel that I'm like, I want to do more with that character. I've got to find ways to bring that character back into what we're doing. And she's having, I, I, I like to think, a lot of fun uh, with this world and having kind of a sense of ownership over the design of some of these possessed objects, what they do to people or how they kind of manifest uh, and how our characters can kind of battle them and combat them with everyday kind of mundane objects. Uh, and I, I, I think she's loving it. Like, and I'm every page she turns in, I'm just like, Oh yes, please send me more. Nice. And then with, with magical Natalie too, I would say, you know, just cause we're talking about three projects here. Um, you know, Katie has really adopted her art style uh, cause she used to do like really, really kind of cutesy kind of looking things. And she still got like an element of that. Like it kind of looks, her art style kind of looks like a Japanese, um, like a Japanese scroll drawing, like an mm. ancient scroll drawing. And then she's added in like these, an like these anime or manga type elements into it that just really make it unique. And so I'll, I'll sit there and I'll write like sequences of, you know, Natalie and Lulu doing stuff or like Lulu jamming out on her guitar or whatnot. And what she brings back is just so incredible. Like it just floors me every time. This is why I love working with such a variety of people um, and trying to give them as much freedom as I can within my scripts where they're comfortable with it, right? There are some that like a little bit more direction than others. Um, but all three of these artists are firing on all cylinders. And again, Yishan obviously has a lot of comic book history uh, behind her. Sebastian used to work on video game design for mm. Contra and Fortnite. Uh, and so again, very iconic kind of looking characters within those series. Um, and then Katie's really been in the indie scene for a long time and, and done a lot of just indie books that I've seen go up on Kickstarter. Um, so again, they, they all have very different kind of qualifications and capabilities under their belt, and they're all bringing their A-game, every single page, every single panel. Uh, and it's just a beautiful thing to see. I've known you from the comic book scene, obviously, here, and, and of course, Webtoons. We kind of touched on it in previous interviews, but we never really kind of dived into the the nuances of of putting from going from a, a horizontal to a vertical sized uh, comic because I, I I know it's a different format at least for me to to view because I'm used to like flipping, but how about yourself as a creative person then in terms of your format and in terms of how that changed from script writing to getting the art for it. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Webtoon, uh, one, it's a growth platform, right? Like this is where all the new readers are kind of growing. You've got one of the largest uh, followings on Lore Olympus, their their number one series at like, I think just shy of 6 million active subscribers. Um, you juxtapose that with like the literary graphic novel scene. I think Dog Man's latest volume was like 1.4 million copies in two months. Uh, it's just night and day. Um, but the other thing too that I liked about it was the challenge of trying to write to the vertical scroll. With printed pages, you have kind of typical conventions that uh, you adhere to, right? So like every odd number page, the page turn, if you will, tends to end on like a cliffhanger or a question or something like that. Usually after your first page, you've got some kind of splash reveal on the inside. Uh, and your scenes are typically lasting anywhere from like one page to two pages to four pages so that you've got, you know, again, kind of that scene end on the page turn. And those are conventions that I don't get to use as a crutch on Webtoon anymore because the entire purpose on there is just to get people to keep thumbing up so that they'll keep scrolling down and reading the next panel and reading the next story. And how do you do that? And how do you in, uh, get that intrigue and that desire for people to keep going in uh, deeper into the story uh, by physically and actively engaging with it much more frequently than you have to do with the, you know, the occasional page turn? Then it's also how do you take advantage of that real estate when you need a panel that is more... Um, impactful, right? Like in, in print comics, like you can have a nine panel grid 
or you can do a full page splash, or you can do a two page splash, or heaven forbid, you do an insert and you've got like six pages in there, right? Like you can make a panel very impactful because you have physical real estate to do it. Within Webtoon, you're limited to the screen of your phone, yet you still have an infinite vertical scroll that you can use to try to tell a story and show impact. And we try to do that within both Nexus Point as well as Repossessed when that comes out, where I, you you said you read the, the first episode, right? Like mm -hmm. in Nexus Point, we've got that moment where Pac, this hacker, uh, is being chased by a bounty hunter and he finally turns around and shows why hackers are dangerous. And this invisible screen kind of pops up in front of him. He's typing on this invisible keyboard. And all of a sudden you see these hacking lines like filtered down from him. And as you're scrolling, they're getting closer and closer down to the bounty hunter that he is attacking using code. Um, and I was like, that's just a really cool thing that you can do that isn't really possible to do in the print page. Like one of the coolest transitions I've ever seen on a print page was in lock and key. And they had a scene where it was a full page spread and they, they had characters on one side of a door. And as you turned the page, it was another full page spread with characters on the other side of the same door. And I'm like, that's awesome. How do I do something like that in the vertical scroll? How do I make my panels and my transitions between scenes engaging? Because Webtoon has, you know, I mean, there's not like a standard, but like contractually we have like a panel minimum that we have to kind of hit per episode. And at a five page or five panel average per page, it nets out to about eight pages of content per week. It's a lot. It's it's quite it's quite a lot of content to be producing on a weekly basis for 50 weeks straight. Um, and so a lot of the artists will come up with shortcuts is really disingenuous. That's not really the, the right way to do it, but they've come up with techniques to figure out how can I do this process faster so that I can hit those deadlines, still produce a quality product um, and have it be an ongoing and engaging narrative and story that again, encourages that scroll. And, uh, and so we've been trying to figure out how we'd use some of those techniques as well. Um, and some of them are just in the transitions. Again, like that's a really long panel for us to use where we've got like the hacking lines and that counts as maybe two, three screens worth of content. But in Webtoon's mind, that's one panel, right? <laughs> right. So we gotta we gotta balance out some of those some of those elements. Um, and how do we divide up our scenes per episode, knowing that we've got like eight pages worth of content? And do you have scenes every 10 panels which is about what it equates to on the printed page when suddenly every episode would be five scenes and that just feels really intense like that's a lot of content and a lot of scene jumping to be going through and so the pace that i kind of adjusted into was well what if we only do like two to three scenes an episode and from a writing perspective you're it allows your scenes to breathe a little bit more than they do in the printed page because suddenly instead of every scene being one, two, four pages, it's suddenly four, six, eight pages worth of content and scenes uh, that can let you tell more story, let you dive a little bit more into the world or let you see a little bit more of the characters and learn a little bit more about them within each of those moments. So it's almost more like writing for television mm but it's like a vertical scroll comic. <laughs> so it's fun, it's interesting, it's unique. Um, and it's forcing me to flex new muscles that I haven't had to do before. Um, and because of that, I think you can hopefully tell, I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm loving everything that we're doing with it. And uh, again, it's another reason why I just get excited every time I get artwork in from the people I'm partnered with on these projects. That's the one thing I find interesting because I'm I'm reading a lot of digital comics uh, as I always have, but through Webtoons and Tapas and a bunch of other, there's a ton of these apps that my wallet hates. But when it comes to to something like Webtoons, I I love the fact that you have the flexibility of either fast passing it and mm -hmm. and getting the next chapters if you're really invested in it, and of course you know, seeing it from a week to week basis, if you try to save some money. When it comes to that type of format though, especially trying to keep readers engaged, is that a, a struggle for you as a writer, even though you've been doing this for almost 15 plus years? 
In terms of the content creation, no. It's just serialized content. And the difference in what we're doing with Webtoon with what we did with Albert is just frequency. Okay. Albert, we were producing two printed pages worth of web comics a week. So again, at five, pa five panel average pages, you're looking at 10 panels a week. Mm. Right now, Sebastian and I are producing 45 to 50 on average. Uh, the first episode, I think, was like 90 plus. Mm. So you're looking at nine times the amount of content in the same frequency. Uh, and then it's just ongoing week to week, which is exactly what we ended up doing with with Albert. Um, so it's it's not dissimilar from that perspective. The challenge, I think, from an engagement standpoint is keeping those readers engaged outside of when those weekly updates happen. Mm. And how do you keep them interested with polls, challenges, uh, trivia. Uh, I'm doing a lot of previews and stuff on my Patreon right now where you can get early access to like the next scripts or the layouts or the uh, process that we kind of use to create each of those webtoons. So you're not you're not getting early access to the episode. Um, you do that with fast pass. Uh, but you can see some of the process that we kind of go through to create those and get a little bit of a teaser of what's kind of coming up in some of those those upcoming episodes. Uh, and my newsletter too, I think has been a, a really strong way to kind of drive engagement there as well. Um, and I, I leverage that every month. I absolutely love it. I have people who come up to me at conventions all the time and they're like, your, your newsletter is so meaty and it's so great. And I love every single element of it. And I read it top to bottom. And I was like, Oh man, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, I work hard on it because it's a lot of work uh, to put those together. Whereas most of the newsletters I subscribe to tend to just be like, here's the stuff I have coming out this month. Mm. And you're like, okay, cool. It feels kind of salesy. Could you talk about like why you love it or like, yeah. right? Like what would you do differently in there? And I try to do that in my newsletters where, you know, I try to sit there and say like, this is what we kind of did in this episode, or here's something new and cool that we kind of tried. And we've got, something coming up in episode seven, which will be fast pass. That'll be the fast pass episode that goes live this week. And uh, it's, it's something I've never tried to do before, but again, it's me trying to take advantage of that vertical scroll a little bit. And hopefully this will help to drive interest and engagement and people, you know, continuing to come back for it more and more as they see more of these types of techniques getting used. But we have um, a moment in the story in Nexus point where there's been, there's been a crime and Jack Travis, that one of the main characters is like a former detective. And we start to see a little bit of how his head works. And as he's putting the pieces together, we literally see puzzle pieces come up throughout the episode. And as he puts it all together at the end, they rain down and then they actually form into like the puzzle. And I was like, that was so much fun to write. And something that, again, you couldn't really do on the printed page because you just don't have that same kind of interaction and engagement that you do in Webtoon. And so things like that are how I'm hoping to kind of capture and re-engage those readers every single week, because I'm hoping that they'll keep looking for those types of techniques uh, and those types of ways that we're taking advantage of the platform and the functionality of the platform. Um, you know, other 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 comics on there use animation. Uh, we also have music, and we've got new music coming from from Johnny Young Bosch in future episodes as well. And I think some of those elements also kind of draw people in a bit. Um, but inside the content, no, uh, not not uh, something I feel is very challenging. Outside, it suddenly becomes how do you keep that audience engaged and interested because now they've got to wait seven days to get to that next episode. Um, and that can be a little daunting and exhausting at times. It's almost like my release schedule every Friday. <laughs> I know, right? You're a, <laughs> you're a trooper for doing it too. As much as I, I love these rapid fire interviews, time is always a factor. And I could talk with you for another four hours, which I don't think we'll ever do again. <laughs> but who knows? Never uh, say never. Never say never. Maybe, maybe if I'm ever in Chicago, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a four hour conversation over a pint or two. I'm um, in. <laughs> that being said, though, I hate to say it, Trevor, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Kurt, thanks so much for having me back, buddy. It is always a pleasure to talk with you. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And what's the schedule for both Repossessed, Magical Natalie, and of course, Nexus Point? 
Yeah, so Nexus Point updates on Webtoon every Saturday, technically Friday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Um, so it's totally free. Please check it out. Uh, as of this recording, we have, I think, six episodes uh, live so far with episode number seven uh, coming up uh, this 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 week. And then Repossessed will be launching on the platform. Currently, the launch date is August 22nd. Um, and so if you follow me on social media, you will, of course, hear me gushing about it constantly uh, as it comes out. Uh, and then Magical Natalie uh, will be coming out to Kickstarter uh, from Arledge Press uh, early next year. Date TBD, but again, you'll see me talking about it on social media. You guys can find me online. Trevor A. Mueller is my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram. Find me, follow me, friend me. It is also obviously my website, trevoramuller.com, that you see at the bottom of the screen before you. Um, and you can sign up for my newsletter on that website as well, which is, again, totally free, comes out monthly. I won't spam you. Come back on, schedule another interview. We'll talk about Magical Natalie when that comes out, especially when your Kickstarter comes out uh, next year. I, I'm always going to have a spot open. And maybe, maybe this time around, you'll be tied with Dirk for the most amount of interviews on Two Geeks Talking. All right. I love it. Uh, I love a challenge. We're going to, we're going to get that up there. <laughs> uh, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. Like, subscribe, friend me. I'm going to use that phrasing of yours because I like that. That's actually very nice. And I'm going to throw that in, our, in my videos as well, too. <laughs> we also have a Patreon as well, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT media. I release content like this and I'll be eventually re-releasing the old archive of the Two Geeks Talking podcast as well, too. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the bite-sized chunks that are coming forward. So that's literally 15 years of content that's eventually coming back. So your interview from way back when will reappear. Maybe not in its entirety, but it'll be back. I love it. Link, link me to it. I want to, I want to check it out. I'll, I'll push it. 